Let's make your book into a success. The Right Way Podcast will help you write, market, and publish your book. Write like a professional, publish without fear, and create a following so you can become a number one best selling author. This is your host, Lise Neven. Hello, and welcome to the 22nd episode of the Right Way Podcast. It's a new year. I have a new microphone, as you can hear. And I have a complete list of awesome people that can't wait to share their tips and tricks with all of you guys. First up today is Jeff C. Stevenson. Jeff C. Stevenson is an author that currently lives and works in New York, but he grew up in Southern California. Um, he is the author of Fort New Road, um, a book that well um, is about the cult that used to be on Fort New Road. Um, Jeff Stevenson was first interested in, in Fort New Road after he, in, in um, 1976 after he saw an advertisement in a music magazine for a group, a Christian rock group called All Saved Freak Band. Um, the All Saved Freak Band featured guitarist Glenn Schwartz and Glenn Schwartz was known um, for Pacific Gas and Electric um, and was also a founding member of the James Gang. Um, so, obviously intrigued by this sudden change, Jeff Stevenson um, goes out and investigates the Fort New Road, well, let's say cult. Um, and it's an interesting path because he, he, he takes us on a path from when he was first interested into, well, it's not an obsession, but he just wants to uncover the truth. And he wants to know what happened and he goes on and, and, and befriends the people that were used to be a part of the cult and he um actually digs into um into the past of Fort New Road um talks to the people that left talks to the people that were still a part of it um and it's actually a really interesting uh Fort New Road um I thought it was quite uh, well known in the in in the US um for us British people or other people from all over the world Think Louisa Rowe in the Westboro Baptist Church. Um, it's a bit the same, um, but more culty. I hope you enjoyed the interview as much as I do. Um, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to leave a review on iTunes. Thank you so much for the people that already did. And I really, really, really hope that um, you will be listening to my other episodes as well. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye. Welcome back to the Right Way Podcast. So, Jeff, tell me. Who was Jeff Stevenson before he became a writer? Oh, I think I was always a writer, but I grew up in uh, Southern California, and I've always loved scary movies. Mm -hmm. And so I would always go to scary movies growing up, and I loved to read. My dad was terrific to get me to read. He would pay me a quarter a book for every, read, for every book I read. Wow. Yeah, back in elementary school. So to pick up an extra, you know, three or four bucks when you're – you know, eight, nine, ten is a big deal. So he got me to, you know, love reading, and he'd take me to see scary movies because, you know, back then they were PG-13. You need an adult with you, uh -huh. and we had a real good bond that way. And so I was always interested in, you know, kind of darker, scary things and and all kinds of books. But I always liked a good thriller to read. <laughs> and then, and then when when did you? Decide, like, okay, I am going to start writing and I am going to become an author. Um, actually, I was writing short stories back at that very young age with, uh, you know, a typewriter back then. And I would just type out, I must have written about uh, my parents to read. They were probably only, you know, two or three half pages long. But I would make up my own little covers and would staple them closed and, you know, say, here's my latest story. So back then, and then in, in high school, I got more professional with it, I guess, and then I entered a lot of short story writing contests and won a few with uh, science fiction especially. It was really nice because there's a well-known science fiction writer, Ray Bradbury, and when I was in high school, I won a first place science fiction short story, and then decades later, I was able to meet him and bring that book with me because the award was uh, a book of his short stories. So wow. I brought I mean, yeah, when I met him, and he signed the book for me. So it all kind of came, you know, very full circle to write a story and be, and he was one of my favorite authors, 
and then have that author sign the story that won you the first place uh, award back in high school. So I've always been very fortunate with my writing. <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of people that um, are now authors or writers started out making their own <laughs> little books, um, drawing the covers themselves and stapling everything shut like you did. Um, yep, so so it's, it's it's very funny to to see that as a red a red um, lining or thread um, uh, throughout the the whole experience, I guess. So you um, now publish your first book, Fort New Road. Uh, by Free Thought House um, Publishers. Yes. In June 2015. So right. how 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 did you start writing the book? Well, back in I've always, uh, in addition to kind of you know scary stories, I've always been a huge music fan. Also, so I've always liked rock and roll of the 60s and 70s because that was such a great era Very for music. True. Yeah, I just loved that time period. And there was a blues rock guitarist. His name was Glenn Schwartz. And he played with the original band called the James Gang. And after he left that band, Joe Walsh, um, who he and Joe were very good friends, joined, uh, uh, Joe joined the James Gang. And then Joe later came on to great you know, acclaim with the Eagles, of course, later on being their mm -hmm. lead guitarist. But I was always a fan of Glenn, and he left the James Gang. He joined a band called Pacific Gas and Electric in the 70s, and their big hit was Are You Ready? And then he disappeared from sight. And then a few years later, I saw an ad in a magazine for the All Saved Freak Band featuring Glenn Schwartz. And I about fell out of my chair when I saw that <laughs> ad back in 1976. And so, of course, I ordered the record by the All Saved Freak Band to hear what Glenn Schwartz was up to. Uh -huh. and, then, and then how did you start writing um, the book you write, you're, um, you're written now? Um, well, what happened was... Uh, they actually, Glenn recorded four albums with the All Safe Freak Band, and over the years I, I got all four of the records, and they were very interesting, somewhat bizarre religious rock group from the 70s and early 80s. And once the internet came into being and I kind of nosed around, I found out they had kind of an interesting backstory, that they all lived on a community in Ohio, about 50 of them, and they recorded these albums, and they had a, a leader, his name was Reverend Larry Hill, and he's still alive, and on, one, on the surface of the story, they made these very, you know, eclectic religious albums. And then the backstory was there was something very strange going on in this community they lived at. And it turned out it was actually a cult. And they people that lived there just couldn't get away because, like most cults, uh, once you get in, they, they tell you that they're the only way. And if you leave the cult, you're going to die or go to hell, something like that. So I just found the story fascinating and they had a website, and I reached out to Joe Marco, who was one of the former members of the cult, and he co-founded the All Safe Freak Band with Larry Hill. And we became friendly, and one day by email I asked him, because I was in New York and he was in Ohio, you know, would you mind telling me a little bit about the backstory of the band and what it was like to live on Fortney Road? And after a few days he wrote back and he said yes, and then he started to tell me what, what life was like on Fortney Road, and then... Eventually, 17 other people contacted me. So I interviewed all these different people about what was like life like for them in this religious community. And it turned out to be one of the most abusive cults of the 60s and 70s, worse than anything people have heard about the Children of God cults or the other cults that were so popular back then. Wow. And, and how did it make you feel? Because I, I guess if, if you're talking to these people and you want to write a, st write a story about it, you want to dig deep. But obviously, I don't... I don't don't think you would want to like open up a cesspool of of like gory details or or whatever like how did it make you feel as a, as a as a as a person well what they did was some of them wanted their real names used and some of them wanted me to use a, a made up name form but one uh there was one young girl in this um uh the leader of the cult Larry Hill he would sexually abuse the women even the children that were there and, and also physically abused them with whips and, you know, uh, lack of sleep. Most of the people only slept there three or four nights, um, three or four hours a night, which is very common in cults. So he would wear them down by lack of sleep, and then he would sexually abuse them and then whip them with this big whip, um, you know, make them get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and run five miles. So the, the abuse was, you know, sexual and psychological and physical, 
And again, some of them wanted me to use their name, and they went into great detail of what they went through. And then one young woman, she's in her 40s now, um, um, Bethy Goodenough, she was 11 and 12 when Larry was sexually abusing her every day, and she said, I want to tell you my story, and I want you to use my real name. Mm-hmm. So I just began to interview people, and some of them were not aware of what happened to Bethy because they were dealing with their own trauma, and then others would tell me. So I just felt... In, in real shock, but I, I felt such a sober responsibility to tell their story accurately and to cross-check it and reference it to make sure that all the stories made sense and other people would acknowledge it. So I think I just really felt very sober by what they were telling me because, you know, there's that responsibility to tell someone else's life story and you want to get it right, especially something as horrific as, you know, living in a cult all those years. And was there a moment where you said, like, okay, this is enough, I, I can't do it? Or was there something that kept you going? I was. It was an obsession. I spent seven years writing the book. So to spend that long on one project, obviously it has to become an obsession. And I would get, you know, every three or four months, somebody else would call me or I'd get an email from somebody and they would want to add to the story. And as the years went by... Um, you know, I, I had an agent, and they would send it to publishers. <clears throat> it was fascinating um, because Simon and Schuster wanted to publish it, but they wanted to take out all the religious aspect of the story. And I said, no, that's part of the background, how mm-hmm. these people got involved <clears throat> during the Jesus movement and so forth of the 60s and 70s. And then the religious publishers didn't want to deal with it because it was so sexually explicit and there was so much violence in it. So finally, um, I went with Free Thought House, and they just put, they just basically said, this is an important story. We want you to tell it the way that you want to tell it based on the information you found. And so it was an obsession, and turning down publishing offers is very risky. Now, most people never <laughs> do it. But I knew, again, like I said, I had a responsibility to tell these people's stories the way that they told me. So I didn't want it compromised or edited other than basic editing. So I, I held out, and, and Free Thought House did a phenomenal job with the book. Mm-hmm. And how, how, how is the book doing at the moment? Um, are, are you selling a lot? Uh, are you happy with it? Um, how is how's the publisher treating you? Uh, the publisher's been great. They worked up a couple um, covers, and the first one I just didn't find at all compelling. And they sent back a separate cover, And people should go to Amazon, uh, wherever they are, or, or check it out at, at any on-site bookstore or, or order it. But the cover now is phenomenal because it really is a story about rock and roll mm-hmm. and a religious abusive cult. And what they did was they used the lettering from the band's first album, which came out in 1976. So they have that typeface for the book Fortney Road. And the full title is The Story of Life, Death, and Deception in a Christian Cult. And behind the title, they have a guitar, the back of a guitar, and the top of the guitar, the neck, goes up and turns into a cross. And the bottom of the guitar, the bass part of the guitar, has got whip marks on it and just a little bit of blood. So in one visual, you've got rock and roll and a cross and then the sense of abuse going on. So they did a phenomenal job with the cover and the marketing. We've been uh, number one on Amazon in the category of cults a couple times. And been able to do, and we we were able to receive phenomenal reviews from uh, Jonathan Cull- uh, Kellerman and Dean Koontz was very complimentary of it. He's been aware of the book for years, so we have, if they go to the Free Thought House or just Google Fortney Road, a phenomenal amount of, of just amazing reviews. It's very humbling, but really thrilling after seven years to spend on something to get that kind of response and feedback. And then a film agent contacted me, and he's working on on shopping the film rights around. Wow. So it's just, um, yeah, it's just become really a phenomenon. And anybody that reads it is just absolutely mesmerized. And one really wonderful thing, I was contacted by um, Classic Rock Magazine, and they wanted me to run, write an article about Glenn Schwartz, <clears throat> which I did. And then uh, Dan Auerbach from the band The Black Keys, he read the article, and his manager got in touch with me, and Dan Auerbach reached out to Glenn Schwartz. Dan is also in Ohio. And he recorded with Glenn Schwartz last uh, mm-hmm. last February, and then Joe Walsh showed up as a surprise guest, and the three of them started to gig around Ohio, which drew phenomenal press. And then the uh, the rock concert out here at Coachella, which was out last spring, 
Um, Dan Auerbach was there with his other band called The Arcs, and he brought Glenn Schwartz out on stage as a guest along with Joe Walsh. So a lot of this you can find on YouTube, and Rolling Stone just said it was the best jam of the entire concert. So the amazing thing about this is for any writer, when you write something, you have no idea what kind of impact it's going to have on people. Mm -hmm. And even bring Glenn out of somewhat obscurity all these years on stage with you know Dan Auerbach, who just also produced the Pretender's latest album, to Coachella is just absolutely amazing. So everybody was just really kind of floored by everything that's gone on with this book and how it's really elevated the story and those people that lived through it. So it's it's just been amazing. Mm -hmm. And to get all these to get all this network laid out, did did you do anything or or did you start contacting people or was it all your publisher? Uh, well, I first started with a wonderful website, FortneyRoad.com that um, a company, uh, Conscious Image in Kansas City, put together. And what I wanted to do was, before the book even came out, was kind of create an, an immersive experience. So if you go to FortneyRoad.com, um, you basically, you can look through. We have pictures and um, music and all sorts of rare items from the book on this website. So you can kind of explore the website to find out uh, the theme line I came up with is what really happened at Fortney Road. So people can kind of click through and they can visit the farmhouse. <clears throat> they can see what a typical day was like at Fortney Road. They can download chapters. They can sign up to get free uh, MP3s and music from the group, some of it that was released, some of it that wasn't. <clears throat> so I first started with that, and then I was very active on social media with Twitter, which is a, 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 a very strong, robust way, actually better than Facebook to get the message out about your book. And um, I had a wonderful uh, Twitter counselor, a couple of them actually, and they said one thing that I tell the authors I know to do is they said, just tweet a couple sentences out of your book every day. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and I just started to do that, and I've got more than like 25,000 followers, I think, now on Fortney Road, at Fortney Road for Twitter. And I also um, did a second Twitter account for Cult History, which is all about cults. So I can kind of cross market the book that way. Yes. So it's really important to be on Twitter, and then of course also Facebook. But I think Twitter is kind of coming its own for for authors, just because it's very fast, it's very easy, and it keeps what you're writing very short and poignant and to the point. So that, those are the kind of couple things I did, and then the publisher, of course, sent out you know a lot of review copies. That's how we got so many terrific reviews and response. Mm-hmm. And. What what would you tell people that um, want to write a true life crime book or a true a true life book like like you, like you are or like or like you did? I what? think like like anything you write, you've got to have a real passion for it. I mean, it's got to be something you can't let go of. So when you come across that story or you read about it, and your gut and your heart starts to get all excited about it, and you know this is what I want to do. Um, know that you can't you can't stop once you start because um you know i my story took place actually started back in the 30s when larry hill was born and i traced it all the way back to then to when he was born and people he knew in class and then i moved it all the way up through um the 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s 90s 2000 and i even went out to ohio to meet the people in the all safe freak band and those that lived on the farm face to face so i could share with them the manuscript i wrote Mm -hmm. So I spent seven years on it, and so you have to have a passion, and you have to have a tenacity, because I have to go through for, you know, police reports and interviewing people, and just really, you have to keep at it and keep writing and keep revising, and then, like any other project you work on, you just can't get give up until you, until it gets out there. Mm -hmm. You said you went through police reports. How easy or how difficult was it to get those uh, police reports well at one point at the end of the cult when when the young woman i talked about Bethy, she was beaten so severely by larry hill's um assistant her name is diane sullivan and larry and diane are, are now married but she was beaten so severely eventually the local um uh child uh, welfare agency was brought to the farm and that's basically when the cult fell apart and Diane was arrested, and she was uh, put on trial. So what I did, uh, again, this is back in the uh, 70s, I was able to locate the judge through reading all the, the um, uh, articles about the, the case. 
So I was able to locate the judge, and then I interviewed him by phone. And of course, by this time, he was close to 80 years old, because the it, it, case had happened back in the 70s. So, and he, he had a great memory about the case, and he added just such a robust explanation of the sentencing he gave and why he gave it to this woman. So I just found digging through you know old newspaper articles, and this was not a huge case, but I found enough that you just kind of follow the threads. And of course, now with Google, everything is pretty much online. But you know, going back to when I started this in 2006 or seven, it wasn't quite where it is now. But like anything else, you just keep going, and you find somebody's name, and you call them up, and you keep calling people up, and follow through, and eventually you can get your story together. And you always want to have, you know, two or three sources. So everything I have in the book has been sourced. And I had lawyers, of course, they bet the book. And they just had me take out a couple things about Eric Clapton because the cult tried to bring him into it. Mm -hmm. But the stories weren't that substantiated. And then there were a couple things that were just, just kind of beyond belief about abuse that Larry was doing. And the lawyer said, you know, you should take those out because you only have one person talking about this. You really want two or three and the book is such a, a, a violent and demanding book to read, it almost goes over the top with those instances. So I took those areas out. So you also want to have a good lawyer to read the book through also. Mm -hmm. And did you have other people that helped you? Um, I had some early readers, some family and friends, probably about eight or nine people, and they read the book and they kind of gave uh, feedback. And the main thing was um, they wanted to find out where all these people were after they left the cult. So I w had to go back, and it, it might seem common now, but I was so engrossed in what had happened to them. But I went back, so at the end of the book, it talks about where everybody is today, what's going on in their lives. So the feedback from other people, if they're you know, family or friends, which are going to be very generous to you, which you kind of want, because this is the first book I wrote, and since, since this book, I've done a lot of short stories. But you know, you want that kind of cocoon that people saying this is great this is great but they all wanted to know what happened to these people what are they doing now so i went back and i interviewed these 17 people again to find out what was going on and then the other suggestion these readers had was they wanted to see um uh kind of put everything in a time and place because again it was in the 60s and it was a different mindset than when where things are today mm -hmm. so that was very helpful to have early readers kind of say oh you know what this is great, but you need this or this. Because I think as a writer, especially a long project like this, um, you get so focused, it's, it, you kind of lose um, um, you know, you lose the forest through the trees. So you need other people to kind of say, you know what, you need to add this and take this out. So that was what was real helpful about other readers. Mm -hmm. And how, 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 how would you say that... Um... Those, the, the, the cult had an effect on those people because I, I guess it changed their lives um, as well as their outlook today. Yeah, so, some of the people that were, um, and this was you know based on the Christian faith, so those that were um, you know raised in the church, and the, the thing about a cult, you, you, people think that people join a cult, you're really recruited to it. And basically they kind of find people that might seem a little... Um, you know, lonely in their life or don't seem to have a purpose and they basically say, you know, we have a purpose for you. If you join us, you'll have a family, you'll never be alone. So they, they, they draw you in. So some of the people that were of the Christian faith before they went in, they, mm -hmm. they've helped their faith afterward. Some of the people that had their faith, um, they are either agnostic or atheist now. They just think the whole thing is a sham. They don't believe anything at all. Um, so coming out of it, um, a lot of them also, they just, they, they kind of blocked it out because, again, during this time period, if they were in the cult for five years or 10 years or 20 years, um, again, they do the brainwashing where you basically believe you don't trust anyone else other than the prophet, Larry Hill, and you only have three or four hours of sleep, but there's no break from that. And there's a lot of uh, fasting where you just don't eat for days on end, and you don't trust other people because you believe you really have a corner on the truth. So once they got out of the cult, it was very difficult for many of them to trust other people. It was just because that's kind of built in, and they kind of think, you know what? If that was the only way to heaven, did I just turn my back on that? Am I headed for hell now? Do I really trust these people? Mm -hmm. So I, I would say maybe 70% of them had been able to move on after all those years, and that other 30% either just are kind of mentally broken people, 
And during the and three people died in the cult also because they fell asleep driving automobiles because <clears throat> they had so little sleep. So a lot of them they still grieve for those people they lost that you know were literal brothers or sisters to brothers or sisters to them while they were in the cult. So there's a lot of ramifications that never really gets out of your system. Mm-hmm. And were there also very negative people, um, negative uh, comments on, on the book? Maybe people that felt hurt or, or people that didn't want to believe it or whatever? Yeah, a few of the people, because again, when I went to visit all of them, I had written pretty much the first draft. And you typically don't share with the people you're writing about you know, the manuscript until it's published. But again, I felt such a responsibility for them because it's like if I were to write your life story, I want to make sure I get it right. So we did share the manuscript with those about 17 people. And some of them were just shocked because they personally had not had any sexual abuse that they experienced per uh, personally or were, or were beaten at all. So for them, it was shocking to read what was going on. And then other people said, oh, it was much worse. You need to, you know, you forgot about this. You didn't know about this. And so what happened after about a month, I started to get reaction coming back to me. And some of them did not want it, the book to be so explicit. They said, you know what, I don't want to hear about, you know, the rape of these women or how these children were beaten. Because what Larry Hill taught was that you beat children until they stop crying. And his reasoning was there was a, a great war coming to America and he was going to uh, protect people. But if you hide out somewhere and the people are invading the country, you can't have children crying. So there was a tremendous amount of child abuse that was going on. But some of the people didn't want to hear about that or read about it. And so basically they said, why don't you cut that out so we can share it with our family and friends without it being so sexually or physically abusive to read. But those people also were ones that didn't want their real names used. Yeah. So it was kind of ironic. The people that said, use my real name, here's what happened to me, they had absolutely no problems with it at all. People that had a hard time with it didn't want any, their real names used. So yeah, we went back and forth. But other than you know changing some dates around and clarifying some information, they all agreed that I, I, I got the story correct. I got it right. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine, though, that some people maybe not told lies, but maybe um, over-exaggerated. Over so how, how do you um, get fact um, separated from fiction? Um, for me, I drew what's kind of a plumb line. In other words, I just went through it because they would publish these newsletters, and I had copies of those newsletters. I would kind of say, okay, in 1970 this happened, in 1971 this happened, and so on. So I, I drew up this kind of a, a, a straight line, a plumb line with the different dates. And I knew that they were recording albums in like 1976 and 1977 and so on. And I could basically figure out where the band was traveling, who was at home, and so on. Um, so everything, when I lined that up, worked very well. The only thing that uh, had two two discrepancies was... Larry Hill was married to a woman, Carol, <clears throat> and she fled the cult, and she took, she had five of her children there, and she was only able to take two of them with her. And there were just two very different stories of how she left. One fellow said that uh, she was actually having an affair with another man, and she fled to move away with this man. And then her son, who I interviewed for the book, Tim, he said that's not true at all. She wanted to take all of us. She could only take three of the kids with her. And so that was a, a choice I had to make between two stories of how she left the cult. And I finally mm -hmm. went with the story <clears throat> uh, that her son told me because he was, you know, that was after all, that was her son. And I also felt if the other story was true and I couldn't collaborate it with anyone, it just kind of put a shadow on her. And the story was really about the people that lived there and that got away. And I was never able to track down this other person that she supposedly ran off with. So when there was, and that was really the only time there was any discrepancy about the story. So I put in what her son said happened. Other people could collaborate with that. And then at the end of the book, I do mention that there were two stories about how Carol left the cult. And it's really up to the reader to decide, but I went with the one that I thought was most accurate. So again, you want to have two or three people that can kind of verify everything you say as you go along in the book. And um, they were surprised, um, you know, how accurate I was able to get. Again, this took place back in the you know mid to late 60s, 1970s. So we're talking 30, sometimes people 40 years earlier to have that kind of memory. Mm -hmm. 
would you would you do it again would you write a book like this again oh absolutely i i i missed it once it was done you know once you the book is edited and it's out of your hands and you wait a couple months for the reviews to come in you kind of wonder what do i do now and um absolutely yeah i mean if i had a, another true crime story like this it would be so fascinating i would absolutely go after it again And in the meantime, I've gone on to write a bunch of short stories. I've written about 26 and had about 15 published. So all, all this, again, is Amazon on my on my link. So I continue to write and now working on a two-part novel. So it's kind of fun to do fiction where you can, you know, make it up as you go along. You don't have to worry about, you know, the hardcore accuracy of nonfiction. But I also love that because you're dealing with real people's lives and their real emotions And they are so appreciative. I mean, everybody that was in the cult <clears throat> has been so grateful that they finally had their story told, mm -hmm. and it was told accurately, and they were, they've just been amazed at the response to the book. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Um, where would people be able to find the book, online and offline? And where would people be able to find you online? Um, they can. Uh, the book uh, is on Amazon, of course, like everything. So they can start there. And the book is Fortney Road, F-O-R-T-N-E-Y-R-O-A-D. That was the area where they lived in Ohio. So they can just Google Fortney Road, and uh, the book will come up. They can order it there. They can order it through their bookstore if they'd like. And, um, again, I've had I've worked so hard with social media presence. If they just Google Fortney Road, all, all the articles about the books and the reviews and so forth will come up. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm on Facebook um, as Jeff C., middle initial C., last name Stevenson. Yeah. So I'm on Facebook, um, and again, they can visit FortneyRoad.com, the website that they'll find really intriguing, and I'm also on Twitter, uh, it's Fortney Road, and under my name, so there's, uh, basically, if you Google the book, you'll eventually find me. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, it was really interesting. Um, I think a lot of people have also learned a lot of, of, of your experience writing this book, um, because it, it's something you... You never hear the story behind it, and especially not with such a, a heavy, um, a, a heavy subject, I guess. So Absolutely. thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to rate and review the show, and tune in next Sunday for another episode of the Right Way Podcast.